second Sunday after Epiphany. This coming Wednesday night, as usual at this time of the year, um, you are all invited to enjoy fellowship and dinner together in Trunk Hall, beginning at 5.30. And then at 6.15 in the Shepherd's Chapel of the Schaefer Center, we're gathering again for the second of what might become three or four a gatherings with Stacy Volivar, a member of our congregation, also an attorney. She's answering questions and providing a wealth of information and insight about getting all of your arrangements, your affairs, all lined up so that in the long way eventual time of your passing, all of your loved ones have a clear paper trail of your arrangements and your desires. Um, and again, that begins at 6.15, Wednesday evening, Shepherd's Chapel in the Schaefer Center on the north end of campus. The featured ministry for this month is confirmation ministry. So before the prelude and the ringing of the bells, we'll see a short feature about that. The confirmation program at ELC is a lot of things. It is Bible study and acolyting. It is retreats and silly games. It is service and fellowship. Confirmation is all of that and much more. Our confirmation program is designed to prepare our young people, typically in middle school, for their affirmation of baptism. Using the baptismal promises as a guide, our youth engage in meaningful experiences that help them to live out their faith and learn to express their beliefs in ways that is uniquely their own. We want our youth to understand the promises that they make to God when they participate in the affirmation of baptism and be ready to step forward in their faith as part of the body of Christ. The covenant we make in baptism to live among God's faithful people, hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, proclaim the good news of Christ through word and deed, serve all people following the example of Jesus, strive for justice and peace in all the earth.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together. Holy God, our strength and our Redeemer, by your Spirit hold us forever, that through your grace we may worship you and faithfully serve you, follow you, and joyfully find you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. is from Isaiah chapter 49 verses 1 through 7. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He named my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a, he made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, and whom I will be glorified. But I said, I, I have labored in, in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my cause and with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord and Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate 
themselves, because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to John, the first chapter. The next day, John the baptizer saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit Descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas which is translated Peter. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
In our reading this morning from the Gospel of John, Andrew gets his due. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all name Peter as the first disciple of Jesus. But John gives that honor to Andrew. We don't need to plow into the weeds of which account is more reliable. All four gospel narratives in the New Testament agree that Peter and Andrew were brothers, both of them sons of a man named Jonah, sometimes put as John, and both of them engaged in their father's trade as fishermen. By all accounts, Peter and Andrew were daily close companions. They worked together, they socialized together, perhaps even lived together. If we feel a need to reconcile the different narrative details about which of them was the first to become a disciple of Jesus, the easiest solution is simply to regard them together as the first two disciples who began their association with Jesus essentially at the same time. It doesn't really matter which of them was precisely the first because the two of them together became the first to follow Jesus. Nevertheless, John's gospel turns a spotlight upon Andrew as if to ensure that he would not be regarded as a mere tag-along sidekick to his brother Peter in the sacred memory of the church. Accordingly, Orthodox Christians honor Andrew with the title Protokletos, a Greek designation that means first called. As Catholic tradition regards all bishops of Rome as successors to Peter, so Orthodox tradition regards all bishops of Constantinople as successors to Andrew. Dozens of places around the world are named for Andrew, and he is the patron saint of several countries, including both Ukraine and Russia. His patronage extends also to pregnant women, farm workers, singers, miners, and butchers, among many others. Andrew's large legacy in Christian tradition is remarkable in part because his is not really a big name in the New Testament. Compared to other disciples, especially Peter, John, and James, Andrew is not the namesake of a single writing in the canon of the New Testament. He is not the author of any of the New Testament epistles, nor is he mentioned in any of the epistles. The little bits of information and insight we glean from the Gospels regarding Andrew suggest that he was esteemed by his peers as a person of sound, practical sense and judgment, someone who could overcome difficulties and get things done. Unlike his brother Peter, who is often depicted as impetuous and rash, Andrew seems to have been more deliberative and pragmatic. Pragmatic also is John's approach to Andrew's story. John tells us that when Andrew asked Jesus where he was staying, Jesus responded with an invitation to come and see. After spending at least one full day with Jesus, Andrew then invited his brother Peter to come as well and to meet Jesus. John gives us a glimpse into the way in which someone like Andrew became a follower of Jesus. In other accounts, 
those of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the narratives cut much more quickly to their outcome. Mark, for example, tells us that when Jesus first met these two brothers, he said, follow me, and immediately they did so. The point is well taken that those who encountered Jesus found in him something urgent and compelling. But it can be hard for us to relate our own experience to that sort of account because most of us, most of the time, do not suddenly alter the course of our lives so abruptly. John's account lingers a bit before reaching its outcome. Andrew spent some unhurried time with Jesus, getting to know him, taking his measure, weighing his words, assessing his character. Our experience with Jesus is normally just like that. Most of us do not and did not plunge all at once and all of a sudden into the deep end of discipleship. Instead, our walk with Jesus lengthens and matures over time as we spend time with Jesus, pondering his words, hearing his story, becoming familiar with his life, sharing experiences in his company, learning to recognize his voice and his presence. This is how most of us become followers and disciples of Jesus. It happens in relationship, nurtured over time. The outcome of discipleship is our confession with the entire church that Jesus is Lord, the very Son of God, the promised Messiah and the beautiful Savior. But we come to know those things about Jesus. We come to know that those things are true about Jesus only as we come to know Jesus. That's what makes our confession of faith a witness. Otherwise, it's just an ideology. We confess that Jesus is our Savior because we experience his saving grace and mercy in the course of our lives. We confess that Jesus is Lord because we experience the power of his love and compassion for ourselves and for others. We confess that Jesus is Christ because we experience his holiness in our own ongoing transformation as his blessed friends. None of this happens apart from time spent in his company. Andrew spent at least one full day with Jesus before he told his brother Peter, we have found the Messiah. Andrew and Peter together with a growing number of other followers would spend many more days with Jesus traveling with him, eating with him, hearing and seeing all the things he said and did in the name of the Father. They would be blessed by him many times over, and they would witness his blessing extended to others, people they might otherwise never have seen in places they might otherwise never have gone apart from the time they spent with Jesus. And in time, they would begin to extend the blessings of Jesus to others as they became not only disciples, but also apostles, revered in the sacred memory of the church as saints. And it all began, in Andrew's case, as for many of us, with the simple invitation, come and see. Amen.
Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Inspire all the baptized to tell of your faithfulness, sharing the good news of salvation throughout the earth. Bless the witness of missionaries and the collective work of your church ecumenical. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Preserve the world's waters. Protect them from pollution, support plants and animals who depend on them, and bring rain in places of drought. Guide us in protecting local waterways and in responding to de devastating floods. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Show your mercy to all nations. Direct leaders to do your will. Fill governing bodies with righteousness. Equip judges with discernment and compassion. Merciful God, Receive our prayer. Draw near to individuals and communities suffering violence, injustice, illness, or poverty. Hide them in the shadow of your hand and make us signs of your faithfulness to all in need, especially those we now name silently or aloud. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You are glorified in the servants you have called. Give us, as you gave Martin Luther King Jr., bold trust in you. Grant us the courage to answer your call to repentance and racial justice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. 
In every place and time, you have sanctified your people. We praise you for the testimony of those who have died in the faith. Strengthen us as we wait for the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. At this time, please take a moment to share the peace with those around you. give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is 
is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you almighty and merciful god through our savior jesus christ in the wonder and mystery of the word made flesh you have opened the eyes of faith to a new and radiant vision of your glory and so with all the choirs of angels with the church on earth and the host of heaven we praise your name and join their unending hymn holy 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 lord god of power and might heaven and earth are full of your glory In the beginning, O God, you created light and fashioned the sun, the moon, and the stars to illumine the day and the night. By the birth of your Son, Jesus, you illumined the world with your holy light. In the beginning, you separated the waters. In the water of his baptism, you anointed Jesus with your Holy Spirit. In the beginning, you made the earth to flourish. In Jesus, you made the earth your home. In the beginning, you created all living things. In Bethlehem, you gathered the animals to attend Jesus' birth. In the beginning, you created humankind. And in Jesus, you took on our humanity, formed in your likeness. In the night in which he was handed over to sin and death, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all of them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As your Son was transfigured by heavenly light, O God, so make your light to shine in us as we bear his life in our flesh and blood. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Together we are bold to pray as our Lord has taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated.
radiant God, with our eyes we have seen your salvation, and in this meal we have feasted on your grace. May your word take flesh in us, that we may be your holy people, revealing your glory made known to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, follow the way of Jesus, thanks be to God.